six million. It's a wild night out there. So a big shout out to a few who came in on their bikes, believe it or not, this <laughs> evening. Uh, so fair play. The title of the event this evening is Green Europe, What Place for Sustainable Agriculture? I'm Emery Vrainon. Uh, some of you will know I present the talk show on local radio, KCLR Live. It's on 10 to 12. And uh, one of the big stories today in the media is actually Coldplay, believe it or not. And they are not touring because of climate change fears. So Chris Martin has said he has to try and find a new way to promote his album. So that's just something I'm going to put out there. So climate change, whether you're a member of Coldplay or you're a farmer from Mullinavat, it's very real at the moment. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers um, and we're going to cover a range of topics. We want it to be lively. We're going to invite you to engage with them, to ask questions, and you will have an opportunity to quiz them. So bear with us. We're going to let them have their say first. Um, and then if there's something that you feel we haven't covered, I'll let you come in. It's not about bamboozling you with scientific facts. It's not about lecturing you, or there's a term out there now, farm shaming. It's about figuring out our journey. We're all figuring it out and we're trying to see what steps we need to take because climate change is real. We, the citizens of Ireland, have spoken. We have demanded change. And this was seen recently in the European and local elections. And it's now seen with young people out on the streets. The young people who are out, I've spoken to lots of them. They feel there's a gap. There's a gap between them and me, and there's a gap between them and their parents, their grandparents. They think perhaps that Greta Thunberg is their inspiration. Their parents might feel otherwise. Their grandparents might feel they had a less wasteful approach to all of our resources. So lately, as you all know, there's been a spotlight on agriculture, uh, the need for the sector, especially for the Irish ag sector, to cut greenhouse gases. Many of you talked to me about Philip Boucher Hayes' documentary on RT1 recently. And a lot of our listeners, as it happens, they're predominantly from rural backgrounds. Uh, they're farmers. They feel they've been unfairly targeted that we need to look at industry. We need to look at the behaviour of multinationals, that we need to look at the bigger picture outside of Ireland. So let's find out what our panel thinks. Let me introduce them to you. You may know them already, uh, but we have the chairperson of the Oireachtas Agriculture Committee to my left here. He's also a Fine Gael TD for this area, Pat Deering, and he's served in this constituency as a TD since 2011. Also a very active member of the IFA, so Pat, you're very welcome. Mm -hmm. And Pat's constituency colleague, Bobby Aylward, also joins us. Bobby is a Fianna Fáil TD for this area, spokesperson, junior spokesperson for farming and skills. He's also from south of the county. Um, so when I call him for an interview, he's either out in a field somewhere or he could be in Leinster House. So he's got the farming background as well. Um, and it's lovely to meet uh, in person tonight, Dr. Pippa Hackett. Um, she was elected as a senator for Leash Offaly very recently, actually, and it was the green wave, some of you may realise, has reached Offaly because Pippa was elected to Offaly County Council for the Green Party in the last local election, so I'm sure it's been a real baptism of fire. She's highly qualified academically in the area that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, these days, she's taken leave from her academic research to raise her family, and she lives on a mixed organic farm, keeping suckler cows, sheep, hens, and horses. Also with us tonight, we have Pat O'Keefe. He's the Corporate Affairs Director with Glanbia Ireland. And Pat, um, you're, you may be very familiar with this byline. Hard for me to believe it's a few years since he's been writing for the Farmer's Journal because he spent 17 years there. So he was very accomplished, very well respected as a reporter and he was deputy editor there. He's from East Cork, but we're not going to hold that against him tonight. You're very welcome to Kilkenny, Pat. And uh, later you will see uh, Professor Frank O'Mara will be joining us on the stage. He's en route from Dublin. He was at, he's at another event this evening. Um, he's Director of Research at Chagas since 2009. I'm really looking forward to hearing his contribution because he's responsible for leading the research programme. So that's every aspect of agri-food research from soils to consumers and an annual budget of 67 million euro. He lectured previously in UCD for 13 years. So we're gonna start with some opening questions. I have a question each for each of our panelists tonight uh, before we move on to a broader discussion and then we'll very much welcome your input from the floor. So I'll start with you, Pat. You're used to having the heat 
the heat on you, so you're not you're not no too problem. worried. Uh, you're well prepared for tonight. Um, Pat, we wanted to ask you about mitigating the worst effects of climate change. It's going to require change. And recently we saw with the ESB's announcement, they closed two peat burning plants in the Midlands. How do we ensure that the workers in these jobs are protected? Um, and your Oireachtas committee uh, discussed recently the establishment of the Just Transition Task Force. Is this something you're in favour of? Yeah, absolutely, Ian Maria. I think it's important that there would be buy-in by everybody going forward. I suppose I'm, uh, as you might like to say, a member of the Climate Action Committee as well, which uh, wh over a number of months last year put together a report which fell into the oil government uh, plan, which was produced there a number of months ago now at this stage. I think we're the only country in Europe at the moment that has a plan going forward. But it's very important, going back to your question, it's very important that there will be a task force together going forward. Indeed, there's going to be change. There's no doubt there's going to be a change. Uh, we see in, in the last number of uh, weeks in, in uh, Pippa's area in particular, uh, where you mentioned the board, uh, board in Amona, substantial change coming in that regard, and we must be ready for those change going forward. From an agricultural perspective, uh, while it, agriculture is the largest indigenous industry in this country, I think it's unfair to kind of equate it uh, with other countries, like, for example, Germany, which is a very industrial country, or Great Britain, for example, a very industrial country compared to ourselves. It's our largest industry in, in indigenous industry, where 130,000 people are employed in agriculture directly in Ireland. Uh, indirect is probably 300,000 people. It, we're a food producing country. We, feed, we produce enough food in this country to feed 50 million people, which is a huge achievement. Uh, and I think from that point of view, in the event that change is coming, and change will come, and I think there's no doubt that every farmer, no matter who you talk to, I'm a farmer myself, you say, you know, farmers have to be part of the solution, not part of the problem going forward. But they have to be brought along the journey, very same as everybody else. And the journey is going to be difficult in some ways, uh, but there's going to be a cost involved in that as well. Uh, and there is no doubt that, that going green is cost, costly. And we see uh, in the last period of time that the cost involved in this, and as I've said before, and I'll say again, the, especially from a farming point of view, we see during the year the difficulties in the beef sector. Um, we cannot go green if we're in the red. I think it's a very important point. You know, by that bad I mean is, if farmers are not getting paid for what they produce, they cannot afford to move to the next stage. So in saying that, I think that the crucial thing going forward is going to be the next cap. Uh, which is presently being negotiated. Uh, it is going to be a change cap from what we were used to in the past, but at the same time, the farmers have to go on the journey. Uh, I think there has to be a huge element of, of communication with all people uh, going forward. I think there's been, and I would have to be critical of farmers and farm organisations, maybe politicians in the past, for not communicating what has been done over the past number of years. In previous caps, a lot of very, very good initiatives were introduced, such as the REP scheme, for example, uh, which was a very, very, very good initiative uh, over the past number of years where water courses and farms were cleaned up, hedgerows were, were developed and so on. And they are hugely beneficial for the, for the future of farming and uh, development of, of farmland and maintenance of farmland for the future. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, Senator Pippa Hackett, we want to ask you about how climate change is at the forefront of all of our minds and to some it feels the change, we know how important it is, but it can feel like it's insurmountable that making all of the changes. When it comes to ag, it, we, given your own farming background, what are the steps that you think that every farmer could take to lower their carbon footprint? Um, thank you, it's great to be here tonight. Um, I suppose we actually do constantly hear um, the negatively framed narrative that, you know, how much is it going to cost us to go green? You know, what is the cost of climate action? Can we afford to make the necessary changes? Um, I think the good news for many farmers is that actually lowering their carbon footprint off their farms should be relatively pain free and should actually, if done correctly, save the money and perhaps even earn them extra money. So farm income really for me is, is, is the important thing. Um, I think very. I think a lot of farmers, as as we were, we converted to organic farming about eight years ago, um, and we felt very sort of tied down to the same sort of farm routines, uh, listening to the same sort of advice, um, and there was little opportunity or, or incentive to sort of break away from that norm model of farming. Um, and this was really one of the main reasons we decided to, to convert to organic farming. Fair enough, the scheme was open, which was the in enticement and the incentive necessary. Um, but it definitely gave us the sense that we were sort of in charge of our farms and, we, you know, and that we took charge of it. So we didn't really have that sort of guilt of, you know, oh, we missed the date to get, say, the fertilizer out or we didn't spray the nettles in time. We just sort of got on with it and it was up to us. We thought further ahead. Um, and we, we, we use that to our advantage. 
um, in a weird way, I suppose our neighbours, you know, once we'd, it was a bit of a talking point, you know, oh God, they've gone organic and we're going backwards and it was, you know, perceived as negative. And now they're quite used to our maybe unkempt looking fields because we've a few nettles and docks and so forth growing, you know, but it's, it's more accepted now. So it's about having a different view about what we, how we farm our land and, and what we do with it. Now, I'm not here to just promote organic farming, but I'm more about to tell you the lessons that we have learned. And even now, if we were to be conventional farmers again, we probably wouldn't change anything that we have been doing for the last eight years because it works for us. Um, I think the first steps for any farmer um, to try and lower their carbon footprint on any farm is to look at your farm accounts. See where your outgoings are. See where your incoming amounts are. Because we can't do very much about the price we're getting for our product. Um, but the only thing you can control are, the, are the, the expenses you put into your farm, inside your farm gate. You put 100% control over that. So, you know, think about that, where you could uh, make the adjustments. Do you have, you know, really high diesel bills? Is there something you could do to, to restrict the amount of tractor work you do? Um, do you have, um, uh, you know, have you a huge outlay on, on nitrogen fertilizer or whatever fertilizer uh, you're using? Is there an option there to really cut that back? I mean, if you're a beef farmer and you're only getting 345 or 350, oh, it's creeping up by all accounts, but I'll, I'll wait and see how that, how that uh, pans out. But if you're only getting that sort of amount for your, for your beef, cut your fertilizer right down, I would, because you're, you're not getting paid for it. You're spending money to actually lose money. So cut your costs. So, I mean, that would be a very broad sweeping way of, of looking at, at, at practically at where to, to um, reduce the costs. Um, same for th things like veterinary inputs. If you have very high veterinary inputs, are they due to you know tough calvings, or are you calling vets out for cesareans and so forth? You know, we before we actually converted to organic, we changed our breeds. We had come, we had been generally sort of Charolais crosses. We had Suffolks as our sheep, and we um, we changed our stock bull and we changed our rams. And you know, within a couple of years, you've actually changed the whole profile of your herd or your flock. And we went for easier calving, smaller animals. We went for more native breeds. We went for ones that could manage outdoors without having to be sort of tended to 24 seven, not sort of, you know, so it had a certain resilience built into them. Um, one thing I will say, I know we'll probably come back to it and I have a whole pile of stuff written here, but farmers should sign up to every agri-environmental scheme you can. Um, I do have my doubts about the merits of some of them, but still they're there. And if they do, or whether they don't do exactly what they say on the tin, your likelihood is you will increase your farm income. It might be only by a small amount, but it's still money in your pocket and not in somebody else's. And your emissions might well go down. So you will be lowering your carbon outputs. I mean, it's disappointing to see the relatively low uptake from farmers on the recent BEAM scheme. That for any farmer or any non-farmers, that's the beef exceptional aid measure, which was brought in as a support um, due to the um, uncertainty of Brexit. Uh, not that money wasn't all, you know, taken up. So, I mean, that sends back a really bad message, you know. So apply for the schemes. A lot of them are, that one was particularly easy to apply for, sign your name and send it in. Um, there are certain farmers who feel it's not worth the effort and it's too much, it's too restrictive and that. But I mean, if, you're, if you really genuinely feel that, then you're probably not in need of the scheme at all. Sign up for the schemes. I'll leave it at this just to think that farmers on the whole need to start thinking about their land in a different <laughs> way. It's not just this innate thing that's there just to, to that we, um, pump full of um, fertilizer to maximize production because that's very costly and it's also damaging the land, it's damaging your soil and it's probably not helping your wider biodiversity. Um, and finally, for me, any measure which gives me back more time in my life has to be a saving. So quality of life is very rarely factored in um, to any farm figures or um, any equations that we get. Um, some people may never run out of money, but we will all eventually run out of time. Well, do me. Thank you. Okay. We have lots of, I definitely have, and I'm sure our audience do have lots of questions uh, coming from that. So we'll definitely be coming back to Pippa shortly on some of those issues. Uh, Pat O'Keefe, we've heard on Taoiseach Leo Varadkar speak about um, his own personal decisions to opt for meatless Mondays. Um, we're increasingly seeing consumers incorporating, incorporating vegan into their diet, in uh, vegetarian meals, etc. How is Glanbia reacting to this or trying to guide consumer behaviours as a consequence of the challenges posed by climate change? 
Uh, thank you, Imran. Thanks Q, to the organization for the invitation. Um, and it's been touched on already in your introduction. I think certainly um, farmers in Ireland feel under siege at the moment in terms of the narrative around vegan. And, and I suppose in your question, you say, how is Glambia changing? I mean, ultimately, the consumer is always right in the sense of Glambia as a company has to respond to consumer demand and, and provide consumers with what they ask for, what they demand. So. We're well known, obviously, as a dairy company, but again, since 2010, there's been a food-grade oats plant in Port Leash, and farmers in Carlow and Kilkenny have been growing oats. So recently, we launched a porridge product, you know, with, with dairy and, and oats and a gluten-free product grown from this part of the country. And that's, you know, there's going to be new innovations in that same sphere, because again, we have great oats grown in, in, in Ireland that we can build on. Um, across the world then, in terms of our sports nutrition products, there would be plant-based alternatives with the last number of years in, in the US, for example. Our best known product in the US is um, Gold Standard Whey, which is obviously a dairy product, but there's a plant-based alternative for that. So if the consumer says, I want that brand, but I want a plant-based version, you give the consumer that option. So you don't rule out a consumer. I suppose from a, from a dairy perspective, and again, you know, I think we have a job of work to do to educate consumers more, tell our story better in terms of our credentials and then make the, let the consumers make an informed choice. If they choose to go elsewhere for their nutrients, that's their choice. Um, but I do have a problem, and I, we saw a bit of this last week, with um, people being misled on the nutrient advice by unqualified people. And, you know, there's no point getting into debates about that, specifically other than the fact that, you know, nutrition is a crucial thing in every child and every adult's well-being. So we can't mess with it. So in other words, you know, dairy can put its credentials forward and, and make its case as a nutrient. Other products should, should, should likewise set out the facts in a very clear way. And then we need healthy diets based on scientific and based on factual advice. And, you know, if I say anything about promoting dairy, I have a vested interest. And, I, you know, that's a fact because I have a vested interest, you know, in the, in the, in the Glanbia perspective. But I don't believe in misleading people in terms of, you know, the nutrient content. So I think that's really important. I mean, you know, at the moment, there's a lot of noise as well about, you know, calling products meat or calling them milk. And again, I think Europe is probably better than other areas at tightening up on that in terms of that there's clarity in terms of, because consumers, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientific background, but when you go into a supermarket and look at the shelf, it's very confusing, all the noise, all the stuff, you know, claims, natural, wholesome, GM free, it's very hard, organic, you know, the whole thing has become very blurred for consumers who are not scientists. Um, I think, you know, companies have a responsibility to be honest and very clear. Um, I suppose, you know, from an Irish farmer point of view, we have to tell our story better also in, in schools in a factual way. And, and I agree with Pippa in terms of the nutrients. I don't like her language just to pick up in terms of, you know, farmers pumping their soil with fertilizer, because again, that's kind of provocative language inferring that, you know, one particular system are, are you know, and it's even that kind of language. And I don't mean to be, you know, okay. zoning in it, but it's, you know, organic is a very good system. Conventional farming is a very good system and we shouldn't be knocking one or the other. I'd much prefer a kind of a less of the sort of knocking one system and saying, look, I'm proud of what I do. This is how I produce my food and I'll stand over it. Like our farmers, we have 4,500 farmers who produce milk some of them are here in the audience. They're very proud of what they do. They're very passionate. They have to be audited by Borbia. They have to stand over their food. Organic producers are really passionate about what they do. And likewise, they have to stand over what they produce. And I think both of them should extend, stand side by side. I'd love to see more talking. And I think we're starting to see a little bit talking together rather than talking at each other. Because a lot of the conventional farmers now tell me they want to learn more about biodiversity. We, we have a program we're involved in, in Cork. And I'm drifting off the question a little bit. But it, the Bride program, where what would be perceived as intensive dairy farmers are involved in a program to improve the amount of wildlife on their farm to biodiversity. And it's working very well, but it's, it's a pilot program scale. In fairness to the farmers involved, they got the money. We need to build on that. We need to do way more in terms of, we fenced off the rivers through reps a number of years ago. We need to build on that now in terms of, you know, more riparian zones to protect the water courses. There's a whole lot we can do, but I think I want to start talking together rather than talking at each other and sort of one system is better than the other. Um, the consumer's bamboozled. We need to be honest with them, set out the facts of their products, and have an honest conversation about food and not be sort of slamming one product. I mean, it's, you know, it's not helpful, I think, from a consumer education point of view in terms of informing the choices. OK, thank you very much. Some very interesting points there. We're going to move on uh, to Bobby Aylward, uh, Fianna Fáil Deputy. Bobby, the implications of Brexit, the possible ramification of the Mercosur trade deal, it's all adding up to what might be described as a perfect storm for the Irish beef sector. 
um, and with the need to combat climate emissions added into that mix, what can we do to protect the sector's competitiveness? Yes, no, there's no doubt about it. Brexit is coming down the road and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we have to accept it. That's the decision, a democracy decision by the people of Great Britain and they decided they want to pull out of Europe. So we have to accept that. As we all know, we produce 90% uh, of the beef we produce, in, in beef I talk about in particular now, uh, we produce in this country is exported. Uh, we export enough to feed, I think, 30 million people and there's only 5 million people in this country. Um, and uh, unfortunately, 50% of that beef goes directly into, into Great Britain. So we have, we have a problem come down the line. And then we have the Mercosur deal, uh, which is another problem. And um, uh, I don't think that deal should have been signed up. It's not fully signed up to yet, but it's, 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 it's moving that way. And it looks like the deal is, uh, is, is going to go through. Um, it was my belief that we should have a set, and uh, Minister Michael Creed has said that he will do, a, a, he'll commission a, an impact assessment on it. I think that impact assessment should have been carried out before it was ever even uh, contemplated or joined uh, uh, on the Mercosur deal and agreeing with it. Um, to see what kind of an impact uh, this Mercosur 99 new tonne of beef coming into this country. There's already 175,000 tonne of beef coming in from South America, from the countries of South America. And to add another um, 99,000 tonne on top of that is going to have serious consequences for us in this country, uh, in particular, and the whole of Europe. We're says at the moment with Britain, we're self-sufficient of 102% beef. So we're 2% over what we eat in beef in, in Europe. When Britain pulls out, which will happen shortly within the next couple of months, we'll be 116% self-sufficient. So we have 16% of more beef than we're taking, than we're consuming at the moment. Now we're trying to get markets in other places like China, etc., and we're trying to get markets all over the world, uh, small at the moment, but unless we get open up these markets uh, and get into these new areas, uh, we're going to have serious problems. And that's why I think this, uh, as, uh, this uh, impact assessment should have been carried out first. I know France are very angry over this uh, extra um, um, beef coming in, and didn't just beef, the chicken as well, and pig meat and all coming in as well under this agreement. And it's my understanding that the reason why, of course, international trade agreements has to be part of, of, of life, but uh, my understanding is the care industries in Europe want to get access to Europe, into South America. And this is why this World Trade uh, Agreement has been taking place. So look at Germany, who's produced a lot of cars, want to get their cars, and we're talking about carbon emissions and cars and diesel and petrol, you know what that is. And uh, they want to get them over there. So we have to do likewise a trade, like give them access so we can get access to their markets. Then we have traceability. Like we are scrutinised here in Ireland and all over Europe, traceability, and we have a fantastic uh, uh, traceability system in place where we know our beef, our quality of beef, where it comes from. Every animal that's uh, the animal that's killed, and uh, you can trace it back within within a half an hour where it came from, what farm it came from. Have we the same traceability in South America? Will the, will the standards be the same? Will the beef be the same standard as we have here? If not, should it be allowed in? And these are questions that need to be asked, and I think uh, these are questions that need to be assessed. France, as I said, are very angry over this uh, extra beef coming in, and they are about the traceability. And we have like most like-minded uh, countries that we should be talking to to see is this a good deal and is, is, is this a good deal for beef. So, um, you know, uh, the carbon emissions, we are responsible for 30, uh, as I say, we farmers are responsible, agriculture is responsible for 33% of the greenhouse gases emissions at the moment. Oh, yesterday morning with my colleagues, three and four colleagues met, the uh, department officials that are in climate change and how we are going to go forward. In agriculture, 2030, under the agreements, we, in agriculture, we had to get a reduction of uh, 10 to 15 percent reduction in agriculture. How are we going to marry that? We're going to increase our herds as this happened, as this happened and happened to the 20 to 30 percent more dairy cows in the last uh, in the last four years since the milk quotas were lifted. And uh, there's a big demand for more milk, more milk products, as Pat and Lowe here, and more beef. And by 2050, this maintain we'll need three times more. Uh, pr product of uh, agriculture product to feed the world at that stage. So we have to marry all this together. I think farmers are, and there are a lot of few members here today, and I spoke to them several times during the year, they're all willing to play their part, and there are, they are means, and when they're explaining to us means of how it can be done. And there's, there's, there's terrible research that's going on now. You know, just 
just a simple thing, blade clashing, uh, 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 spreading slurry, uh, place splash, they call it, that's why we're spreading up there and just fall down the ground. If you stitch it in the ground, you can save uh, many thousand tons of, uh, of emissions by doing that alone. Uh, they're even talking about dietary for, for animals, genomics, about better breed of animal, uh, not as big an animal, uh, lesser, uh, lesser uh, methane gas coming in, in other words, what they'd be passing and that kind of thing. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of means there, and that's only a few of my touched on, but um, there's a lot of means and ways of reducing our greenhouse gases in, in farming down to, to 15 and 20 percent. And we have to, to 10 to 15 percent is targeted for farming within the next 10 years. That's what we have to do. And I think we will reach that with uh, good smart management, smart farming. So okay. I think that's the way to go. Thank you very much, Bobby Aylward. Uh, you're very welcome, Professor Frank O'Mara. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, you've said recently that Irish agriculture can reduce its greenhouse gas emissions without cutting the national herd. How is this possible uh, when we see the government's Climate Change Advisory Council suggesting a cut in the suckler herd of over 53%? Okay, well, good evening, and firstly, apologies to all the audience, my co-panelists here and the IIEA for my late arrival. I was down the country at um, a training event for co-op uh, board members and executive members on this very topic, and I can tell you the interest was, was huge among those people uh, about it, so it was hard to get out of the room uh, in time. But look, um, Bobby, I think, has alluded to the complexity of this, and you know, we often look at things as uh, in one dimension. We have to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but there's loads of other things we have to do as well. You know, we have to improve water quality, we have to improve biodiversity, but also, you know, the world, there's, there's the population of the world is going to grow by about 2 billion within the next 30 years. They have to be fed. Farmers have to make money. Uh, so there's lots of things uh, have to go on at the one time, and just it's, it's often hard or wrong to kind of just pick out one problem and say this is how we deal with that without looking at the consequences on the other but having said that you've asked the question and um, the the climate change commission was set up by the government to kind of you know give independent oversight and advice to the government as to what it was doing and what options might be available to it and one option they looked at for agriculture as to how it might achieve a 30 percent reduction in in emissions was to, to cut the national herd now when they did that they didn't uh, take into account and it wasn't like i'm not saying the study was flawed or anything like that, but, but they just looked at how many numbers would you need to drop to get that reduction. There are other ways to get that reduction. There are ways through mitigation that I'll talk about in a second. So, so that's, the, you know, that, that was one particular scenario they looked at. The government in the meantime then came, has come along and having consulted with all the stakeholders and the citizens' assembly on climate change and the joint, uh, the report of the Joint Oireachtas Committee and so on, and uh, taken all that information into account, came forward with the Climate Action Plan to get Ireland on track to meet its obligations uh, in the 2021 to 2030 period. And in that, as Bobby just said, and I'm sure others may have said it before I got here, Ireland has, uh, our agriculture in Ireland has a target to reduce its emissions by sort of 10 to 15 percent. There's a range given, and I suppose it depends uh, where, where you start from. And uh, the analysis that we have done in, in Chagask, uh, looking at the mitigation options that are available, things that farmers can, can do right now to reduce emissions shows that we can achieve that level of reduction if we adopt those emissions. So that's why I have said we can avoid a reduction in the national herd and still meet the targets that are set for agriculture in, climate, uh, in, in the Climate Action Plan. The big, the big if after that, if we adopt the mitigation measures, and we need to adopt them soon as well, you know, we can't wait until 2028 and 2029. This, this has got to start now because uh, it's not a target to reach in 2030. We actually have targets in 2021, 2022, every year. So the things, uh, Bobby has, has done a great job of outlining some of them there. You know, there's the, the way we spread our slurry. And I suppose in, in, deve in developing uh, what we call mitigation options, these are things we mean to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have been very conscious of trying to develop workable solutions, things that won't cost an arm and a leg for farmers, things that can actually be applied that are reasonably practical. So one of them is the, the, the trailing shoe. It's a different way of spreading slurry instead of, as, as Bobby said, throwing it up into the air. You get a lot of volatilization. That's a greenhouse gas going off up into the air. Instead of that, trickle it down along the ground or inject it. You get better value out of the slurry in terms of the subsequent grass growth and you get less emissions. The other big thing that we're, we're suggesting, or one of the other big things, is the, the type of fertilizer that we use. Farmers need to use fertilizer to grow grass. Um, nitrogen is one of those fertilizers. 
the form of nitrogen that we use in this country is called CAN, calcium ammonium nitrate, that's the one we mainly use. If we switch that to urea, we get a big drop in greenhouse gas emissions because that can, about 1% of it goes off up into the atmosphere as a very, very powerful greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide. It's 300 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So even 1% of it going up into the atmosphere is hugely, um, hugely damaging from a climate point of view. Switching to urea negates most of that. The problem of just a straight switch to urea is you're swapping one pollutant for another. U urea emits a lot of, of, of ammonia, which is another gas, not a greenhouse gas, but another harmful gas. So there's a form of urea called protected urea that doesn't emit the ammonia and still gives you the benefit of the, the reduced greenhouse gases. So that's another solution that farmers can adopt. There's then good farming practice, like you know, running your herd as efficiently as possible, uh, getting, making as much use of grass as you can, um, incorporating clover in your pastures and reducing nitrogen as a result. So th there's, there's a, a, a number of items, there's no one si silver bullet, there's a, a number of actions that farmers uh, can take <coughs> to reduce their emissions. And if we do that, you know, that's how we can, we can square the circle. And are farmers doing that are th at the moment? Are they, are they taking up those ideas and running with them now or is it, is it a yeah. slow uptake? Well, look, it's, it's certainly some of them are, are, are going to be a slow uptake, like the, the switching of fertilizer type, that's a new thing. And you know, none of us like change. You know, if, if I said to people there now, go home tonight and uh, say to your wife or your husband or your partner or whatever, you're going to sleep on the other side of the bed tonight <laughs> and see the reaction, you'll get to that. Yeah. Like, no one will like change. So, so but I think um, the, the protected urea, you know, that's, that's slowly becoming, um, I suppose, in farmers' consciences, this is something they can do. I think, Frank, like farmers have shown over the years a great ability to take up technology when it's, when it's proven by Chagask and it's easy to implement and it's supported by government. I mean, it doesn't have to be all, you know, carrot versus stick. I mean, farmers and farmers, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm 45 years of age and, you know, working in the agricultural sector since I came into college, I've seen a huge amount of technology like the EBI. I mean, that was a new technology breeding index for cows uh, that farmers brought in. Clover, Frank mentioned, again, farmers, a lot of farmers are crying out for more research from Chagas to say, can I use more clover? Will I have problems? How do I use it properly? We brought out a, a solar scheme this year in terms of um, an opportunity for farmers to, to look into solar energy and to, to, you know, to reduce their electricity bills, to reduce their carbon footprint, to heat the water for their dairy. Um, we have 600 farmers expressed interest, like we have 4,500 milk suppliers, 600 signed up straight away. Now, they haven't all put in solar panels, but they've expressed interest. So in other words, they've put their hand up and saying, I'm willing to invest. Now, they'll want government support to help them make that transition, no different than you know, the, the grants for uh, retrofitting um, energy in buildings and houses and all that. But I'd be very confident that farmers with the right technology, with the right support from the likes of Chagas and the likes of Glan Bay, but also government support. And solar policy needs central government policy that encourages farmers. We've seen it in Europe where good policies from central governments, you've had bioenergy, you've had biogas across Germany, you know, France. There's a lot of things we can do better from a policy perspective that will drive the change. And farmers, in fairness to them, are always very adaptable and willing to adapt and write a check you know, write a check to invest in new technology. Okay, you said something earlier, Pippa, um, about um, the poor uptake um, in the in the beef scheme, um, in the beam scheme. Why do you think that is? Um, <coughs> Any idea, maybe I that think, maybe. I, think I, the, the, I don't know. I've spoken to different farmers. I mean, I visited a group of actually. There were dairy farmers in East Cork last year, and um, I actually asked. I was just listened mainly, and I asked one of the questions was. I said, Are you any of you in glass? in the glass scheme, and um, they weren't because it was going to be too prohibitory, it was going to restrict what they did. So I th there's a problem with the scheme if it's not even engaging with farmers who could engage with it. Maybe the, you know, so I, you could question maybe the, the what's in the scheme itself. I mean, but I mean, we talk about, you know, looking for better markets for beef and so forth, well, more markets. I mean, there's no point opening up a market to China if it's still only going to pay 350 a kilo. That's no good to our Irish farmers. Now, to, I, I wasn't actually slamming conventional farming. I was trying to pass off the wisdom I have learned from organic farming. I mean, I, I'm educated as an agriculturalist in the very traditional way, and I was fascinated when I was at university learning about it and the, the you know, the, the efficiencies and all of these things that can be brought in. But I mean, the plain and simple fact is, I think even if we do apply all the, the roadmap uh, features of the Chagas uh, suggestions, 
we, we cannot decouple our emissions from the expansion of the dairy herd. We, um, the, some of this, uh, like the BDGP was questioned, that's the Beef Data and Genomics Program, was questioned by you, you, EU auditors as to its you know, environmental outcomes. You know, is it actually performing? Um, Chagas have recently abandoned their Better Beef Program, which was one of your flagship programs. You know? So, I mean, there, there's a lot of demonstration farms which have fallen aside, you know, being run so tightly and so efficiently. We need resilience in farming. We need to have that sort of do you want buffer to come back zones in there, there. And, yeah, and okay. I think we haven't had that, and that's where things start to fall apart. You need the, that, that yeah. freedom. Okay. Yeah, look, I, I do, and look, I know you probably didn't mean it, Pippa, but I hate to use that kind of emotive language. We have a, we've abandoned something. We haven't abandoned uh, beef farmers. No, we have more... No, I said uh, the programme, not beef yeah, farmers. Yeah, when yeah. I come to that, we have more resources uh, allocated to beef than we've ever had. Uh, we're advertising for three new researchers in, in Grange, uh, the ad to go out in the next week or so. But we, the Better Beef Programme, in conjunction with the Farmers' Journal and uh, three of the, the meat companies, has been running for 10 or 12 years. And the, the people have decided, the funders have decided, look, let's do something different. So we're going to be actually coming forward with a big programme around sustainability for both beef and dairy farmers. So that network of, of farmers will be probably establishing something like 30 beef farmers. We're going to call them signpost farms. And uh, the, the, um, uh, probably about 50 or 60 dairy farms in that. So a network of somewhere around maybe 80 to 100 farms that are demonstrating uh, not just profitability and, and good production, but also sustainability on their farms. So, you know, I know you didn't mean it. But, but how, are, how are we going to get the profitability there when yeah. our... The, our beef is valued at 350 yeah. kilo. Well, look, where is the where is the profit to be found when that's yeah. unfortunately what the market is willing to pay? I mean, the demand for beef in Europe is stagnant, if not going down. Absolutely, the, so, this year you know, has been a really, really tough year for beef. Markets are cyclical, though. You know what I mean. The demand for for meat globally is uh, quite strong at the moment because of the the crisis in China, and that's. Rever reverberating or whatever the word uh, right through all, all, all the meat factors. I'm not saying that beef is going to go back to 450 next year, but you know, you, when prices are, are at their lowest, you think they'll never rise again. When they're high, we think they'll never drop. Prices do change. At, at the moment, farmers are really challenged to make profit out of beef. All we can do, you know, we can't set the market price. If the market is going to stay at 350, yeah, we're in huge, serious trouble, not just Irish beef farmers, but beef farmers all over Europe. If that's where it's going to stay, it's a really, really tough place. But what we can do, I suppose, is show them, look, these are the things that impact on your profitability, whether times are good or times are bad. And they're simple messages for us. They're about making best use of what you grow on your own farm, your grass. They're about having your anim animals as healthy and as productive as possible in terms of uh, their fertility and, and, and that. And growing your animals then as steadily and as efficiently as possible off grass. So they're simple messages. Okay. We let uh, Bobby in yeah. before we go to the floor yeah, for questions. Up on the bean scheme, yeah. why it's not attractive yes. to farmers. The reason why the bean scheme is not attractive to farmers is because uh, farmers had to reduce their stock by 5%. And that was the first thing that was against it. Uh, so farmers weren't going to take up a scheme. It was an environmental scheme. Because but it's not attractive. Because they're very clever about how they be did that. They sold you know, a month earlier. One of the reasons was, yeah, you could waste. do it. I mean, I'm going to have to do it in my own farm and my son. Uh, but, but I'll have to reduce uh, five c cows to, uh, to get... Or I'd have to pay back the money that I get from being wherever you get to the farm at home. And the same way with loss. Loss wasn't attractive because you had to, plus I should say, because you have to, uh, um, you have to plow maybe an acre for a hen farm and this thing. And, and farmers didn't want, to, didn't want to, that were in grass, were so tied into grass and so efficient in grass, they didn't want to be able to <coughs> give an acre over to this. So the best scheme that was ever brought in this country was the REF scheme, as Pat mentioned earlier on, the Rural Environment Protection Scheme. And why that, was that the best that, scheme? That, because it cleaned up Ireland. It cleaned up Ireland before REF was brought into this country that we were actually way behind and there was slurry running rivers, there's no doubt about that, and the pollution was taking place and down my, where I come to South Kenny, the water works a couple of times a year was always uh, poisoned with, with slurry. That's all gone because the REF scheme was the best scheme as ever. It was a simple scheme and every farmer does REFs one up to REFs five over 30 years. And that was the best scheme that cleaned up Ireland and to something like that scheme we need to go back. An environment scheme, but that'll work. Okay.